Now normally when I'm doing regular bags I can vacuum pack. This is the procedure I do. Now I have some cheeses here that were, these are sliced cheeses that were put into a freezer for several months. If you have ever tried to thaw out sliced cheeses and expect them to go back to being sliced cheese, it doesn't work out too well. So I have some Let's see, Gouda and provolone and Halvarti cheeses that once they were thawed out, they just kind of crumbled. So I threw those into freeze dryer and freeze dried them. And I'm going to go ahead and package them up. Now, usually when I do this, I'll take the bag and I'll kind of put it at a right angle to the uh, sealer and I'll put a crease in it something like this. For one, that takes a lot of the air out of the bag. I'll go ahead and put this into the sealer, just sticking out just barely on the other side. And I'll put two seals in it, one on top of the other. The first will be facing frontward. And I'll flip this around. And then I'll line it up on this back side. So they're kind of stacked on top of each other. And I'll just let it hold there for a minute to cool down. So you can kind of see there's, this is the first seal and then the second seal. So the one on top of each other. So I'll do this to all the bags here. And then each bag I will cut the corner off. So I will have the manufacturer seal and then my seal and where this intersection is. I will cut the corner off, making a vent hole right there in the corner. And then I'll wrap a rubber band around it, just holding the two sides together. This will keep any food from coming into this upper section. Just like so. Now we're going to go out to the garage where my vacuum chamber is. This is my vacuum chamber. So I'm going to go ahead and put the four packs in here. This is my chicken noodle soup. And you can see that the tip or the vent hole is going to be facing up. So that's my chicken noodle soup. This is my provolone cheese. And this is my Havarti cheese. And this is my Gouda cheese. And this is the lid to the vacuum chamber, I'm going to close the valve and turn on the pump. And this only takes, oh, maybe just a few seconds. The reason I have the rubber bands is just to keep the flaps from swelling. You can kind of see how this one swelled just a little bit, but the rubber band kept it in place. Anyway, that's enough time. I'm going to turn off the pump, release the air. take off the top and so you can see how this one has basically sealed itself down on the bottom and the flap up here is nice and smooth and the reason this is sealed is because the vacuum force is so tight it's forcing this uh, these, these two surfaces here it's sucking it in so tight it's actually making a seal preventing this from leaking out. So we're going to go back into the back into the kitchen and we're going to go ahead and seal this uh, vent hole shut with the impulse sealer. So this is the Gouda cheese. I'm just going to put the corner in here, seal that up. So you can see this is where the vent was and now it's all sealed shut keeping the vacuum from exiting. So I have my four bags here that are all, three of them are cheeses. One is chicken noodle soup. They're all vacuum packed with an oxygen absorber inside. And these are gonna last a long, long time. Now that all my strawberries are all packaged up, 
things are not done yet, I gotta go back and take care of my freeze dryer. So my vacuum pump is nice and hot. I have a wood block right here, so I'm gonna tip it forward, stick the wood block back behind it. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the valve here. And I have an empty uh, mason jar underneath. It's got a nice large funnel to collect the oil. I'm gonna go ahead and spin the filter off, put that aside. I'm gonna leave the valve open here. I'm gonna leave the filter off until I'm ready to start my next load. Because as this cools down, and as the, the heat of the vacuum pump comes in contact with the cold air, there's a possibility of condensation on any moisture building up inside the pump. Plus there's a possibility, even with the gas ballast inside this pump, there could be moisture somewhere in this pump, and I just want everything out. And we want to drain the pump while it's hot, nice and hot. The oil is going to have a higher viscosity, and the oil will rush out of the pump at a higher rate and take along any food particulates that's going to be in the, the uh, pump anyway. So that's how that's going to be kept until the next cycle. Now as far as the freeze dryer itself, I'm just going to go ahead and put my fan in here. Go ahead and turn that on. And I'm just going to allow the warm air of the house to go ahead and circulate throughout the chamber and let that melt all the ice that's going to be inside. And all that ice will go ahead and melt. It'll go through the drain tube into a five gallon bucket I have underneath. The constant air of the fan circulating throughout the chamber and throughout the, the shelf and throughout the insulation boards, top and bottom, it'll just be able to dry the chamber out. The drier the chamber, the less likelihood of any bacteria growth. It's just a better way of doing it. It's what I've been doing for the last three years. And this arrangement is going to stay in place until I'm ready to do my next batch of food. Now I have tomatoes coming on like crazy. And I have no time to wait for the freeze dryer to melt on its own or even to go through the freeze dryer defrost mode. So I'm going to show you a really quick way of getting rid of the ice ring that's going to be inside the Harvest Right freeze dryer chamber and to get going on my next cycle. And it's going to take about an hour to do this. Take my handy dandy fan here and I'm going to start cycling warm air into the chamber of my freeze dryer to start to melt the ice that's in the chamber. This is going to take about 45 minutes to an hour. And then when the time is right, I'm going to show you the next step. It's been an hour and seven minutes, and we're ready to clear out the chamber. And just to let you know, down here on the floor, I got this big container. Just to let you know about that. So, this fan has been going, and I'm ready to pull this fan out. And we're going to take off the ring and very carefully we're going to pull this out and along with it is, as you can see, all the ice. I'm just going to take this one off the top and let it drop down. I'm going to take this one off the side and let it drop down. And I'm just going to hold this in my hand here and pull out this bottom one and the side one, and let it drop. So I have a towel right here to get this a little bit of a wipe down here, get the water out, wipe down the side, and put this back. And I know what you're asking. What's the deal with this? So what's the deal with aluminum foil? Well, I have a whole video on that. There's an issue with the shelves heating equally. The bottom shelf here is the coldest shelf. And you can see there's two layers of this insulation that Harper's Trite has placed. And plus it's also the coldest. It's the coldest shelf because it's also closest to the uh, wall of the chamber. 
This shelf up here is the second to the coldest shelf. It has one layer of insulation. It's a little bit farther away from the top. The two shelves right here are the warmest trays. I found out from years of working with this that by putting aluminum foil around the chamber with the laws of thermal dynamics helps the, it helps transfer the heat throughout the shelving assembly and this makes all the shelves more equal and I got videos I actually have a video that studies this with and without the aluminum foil and this can actually cut four to five hours of dry time off your your cycle so anyway, that's a whole nother video there are a couple of drawbacks it does make things a little bit harder to clean you know because you don't have access to the sides but you'll have to just you know weigh the the pros and cons behind that i actually like it because i can freeze dry things much faster with the aluminum foil but i'll leave it up to you but i digress so anyway we have things back to normal the thing i like about this is that taking this ice out and then my ice is down here on the bottom i now have a really nice cold chamber so i can go ahead and start this up like i normally do i'm going to go ahead and hit start i'm going to hit the leaf i'm going to time this and this is going to cool down much faster than my normal timer is going to do so i'm going to reach back behind here i'm going to shut the valve i'm going to hit start i'm going to hit the leaf icon i'm going to hit continue and see right now i'm at 67 degrees normally i'm around 75 degrees so i'm just going to set my timer probably for about a half an hour and come back and when my freeze dryer is in the teens my goal is 15 degrees now go ahead i'll go ahead and load my next batch with which is going to be tomatoes to make tomato powder i've had success with many things i've freeze dried such as ketchup mustard pickle relish of course homemade pickle relish peanut butter and that takes a little bit of manipulation and chocolate and yes both of them go together quite well also orange juice lemon juice and lime juice and don't forget prune juice one of my wife's favorite and if you're into skittles and into candy you gotta try freeze-dried jello squares i've also done some more unusual things such as pizza cherry and pecan pie and dough it's easy to freeze dry things, but bringing them back and reconstituting them back into the original form, that's a little bit tricky and takes a little bit of practice. But also I've had great success with bacon and I have lots of bacon in my inventory. Some of the more unusual things I have freeze dried and brought back successfully was the Big Mac and the Whopper. That was a fun experiment. One of the more challenging things was given to me by one of my viewers, and that was non-food items such as Tide, Murphy's Oil, so Pine Sol, and shampoo and conditioner, which was pretty successful except for the Tide. But I have to admit one of the most unusual things I have ever freeze-dried that was successful was NyQuil. Failures? Yeah, I've had some quite interesting failures and the top three failures I've ever freeze dried were mayonnaise, just way too much oil. And I've had lots of viewers just say, make your own. Butter, just way too much oil also. And it just turns out to be a big mess. And also fish sauce, which I use a lot in Chinese cooking. And it's just way too salty. But I hope you enjoyed this video. And I hope you'll think outside the freeze dryer and go and try different things and try different techniques. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and I'll send you another video soon. And remember, go forth and freeze dry the world.